Hello, everybody. Justin Halverson here. Got another great episode for you today. I sat down with Carl Richards from the Behavior Gap blog and the Sketch Guy column. Carl is a certified financial planner. He has appeared weekly in the New York Times since 2010 and has also been featured as a keynote speaker and as a writer in a number of places, including Marketplace Money and Forbes. Carl has an awesome message for all of us young financial advisors about to enter the industry. And I hope you guys enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the MSU WMA podcast. We've got a very special guest today. We've got the sketch guy, Carl Richards. Carl, thank you so much for being here. Justin, really excited to talk to you about this. Yeah, so I know you from your column in the New York Times and then your blog, The Behavior Gap, which is so great. I'm actually uh, reading Josh Brown's book too, How I Invest My Money. So I, mm. I know I, I know a lot about your background, but for maybe anybody in our program who isn't familiar, can you um, give us a little bit about yourself and tell us how you ended up um, where you are today? Sure, yeah, thank you. So the, I'll try and tell the short version um, I was in college at the finest football university in the country, the University of Utah, which is not a, that, that's kind of a joke, especially <laughs> talking to you, to, talking to people who take football and basketball really seriously. Um, and I was an undeclared major, which some of you may be able to relate to. I didn't know what I wanted to do for a, a living. Um, and my wife, I came home one day, she had recently graduated with a degree in finance. And I came home one day, she had a job and I came home one day and she had the, the newspaper open and she was looking at the help wanted ads. And I was like, what are you doing? She said, I'm looking for a job. And I said, well, you already have one. She said, no, I'm looking for you. And I was like, okay, this will be cool. And I, at the time I was working at a landscape company. I was literally digging dishes for a living. So undeclared major digging dishes for a living. Um, and uh, I said, well, what have you found? And she found what we thought was a security guard job said something about security in it. And so I went to apply and long story short, like it turned out it wasn't, it didn't, the ad didn't say security, it said securities, right? And I, I didn't really even know the difference at the time, but I got the job, which tells you about the applicant pool that day. Um, but I got the job. So I got into the industry quite by accident. Like I was applying to be a mall cop or a bouncer at a bar, right? A security guard. And ended up in the industry, the financial services, financial advice industry. And um, one thing led to another, right? I, I left there. That was the large Fidelity call center. So I was just answering phone calls when people called in. And then I left and went to work for a big brokerage firm. Um, and then I left the big sort of wealth management firm. Uh, I was actually at Merrill Lynch. I left Merrill Lynch to start my own company, my own uh RIA firm. And about that time, I, I started writing things. Like I would, people would ask me questions, clients would call with questions. And I'd say, well, that was an interesting question. And that was fun to talk about. And I, for some reason, just thought, well, why don't I just write down what the answer was? And then I'll share it. And blogs were relatively new at the time. So I started just, I started this little blog called Behavior Gap. And I was really just sharing what I was learning right? Noticing things in the world, like a client would ask about risk, or we'd have an interesting conversation about asset allocation, or about budgeting or whatever. And I would just, hey, I had an interesting conversation today with a friend over lunch. They asked me about this. And I said this, and I would just write that. And then I started trying to illustrate it a little bit. Like I, I got frustrated one day with some clients had a question, and I was trying to explain it, and I was doing my best. And out of frustration, one day, I was like, no, like this. And I jumped up and drew it on the whiteboard. It was like a circle and an arrow and a square or something like it was just super basic. And I noticed the client say, ah, oh, I get it. Right. And I was, I was puzzled by that. I thought this is weird. So I, I started doing that and I added those to the blog and, you know, my mom and my sister were the only ones reading it at the time, but I just kept doing it. And one day, really, I'm not, I mean, it took a year or so for this to happen, but then I got an email from the New York Times editor of the Your Money section, Ron Lieber. He said, hey, I love these, would you do them for us? And I knew 
like from my security guard background, I knew to say yes and figure things out later. So that's, that's when the column started. And then as the column kept going, that was, you know, it ended up being every week and we ended up doing 10 years, but like a year and a half into it, somebody said, Hey, I love Penguin. Somebody from Penguin reached out and said, we'd love to turn this into a book, wrote the book. And then I got asked to do more speaking. And then at some point that stuff took over and the financial planning business became, it was my security blanket. It became an, an anchor. And so I sold that business and focused just on, on writing and the public work I do. So that's kind of the, that's, so I still, I maintain my CFP. I still give advice to a handful of people, but I don't have a financial planning practice anymore. So that's, that's kind of the short version. Awesome. So um, I, I was curious real quick, like how, what comes first when you're writing your blog post for the behavior cap? Do you usually start with the article, the sketch that I see on top, or do you kind of back into that from what you're writing on every week? Yeah, it's a super good question. Um, normally what happens is I've got a I, I just consider it my job to notice things in the world and then share what I notice. And so most of the time I'm, I'm just no, oh gosh, that was a, you know, like I'll give you an example. Um, I was thinking the other day about money, the natural state of money. Somebody mentioned to me like currency or cash flow, like in one, like really close together. And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? They both are like words we would use to describe ri a river, right? Like it's a, there's a current and there's cash flow. And um, there was another one, currency, cash flow. I can't remember what the other one was, but I was thinking about like the natural state of money being in, oh, circulation, like money mm -hmm. circulation, right? Like I was thinking about the natural state of money being in flow. And then I ran across the David Wallace Foster quote about money's natural state is flow or money is congealed energy. That's what he said. Money is congealed energy. And when we release it, amazing things happen. So I was thinking about that idea that, and then I was also, to be honest, I was also thinking about um, some of the stuff from wisdom traditions. And if you particularly, I was thinking about what Jesus said a bunch about like, don't worry about stuff. How many of you, if you had a barn that was full would build another barn, right? Like, mm -hmm the tulips, they don't, you know, the, the lilies, like they don't think about these things. I was thinking about all of that stuff, uh, Buddhism, uh, non-attachment. I was thinking about all that, you know, that's like my job is to notice that, think about it. And then I, so I, I started talking about it, writing it. So this is how it works. I generally write it. And then afterwards, I think if I were to only be allowed to communicate this with one image, how can I capture everything I'm thinking about here with one image? So I think of the images as a souvenir of the experience below, right? And now I actually think of them as a shortcut. The good ones are a shortcut and a souvenir. So a shortcut is like a shortcut into the idea. And the souvenir would be a souvenir of the learning experience you've had with it. So generally it starts, to answer your question, generally it starts with the writing or speaking. And then at the end, I think, how would I, how would I create an icon for that experience? Like a company logo that comes to represent what, what I just wrote about. I can really see that in how I invest my money. I'm about halfway through it right now. And I love mm. starting on that first page with your sketch and then kind of getting, getting a high level idea and walking through it. That's, that's so fascinating. Well, that, that's a good example because that's exactly what I did. I got given the manuscript, right? I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't write those things. And I, my challenge was how could I take what I think would be the key, like I, I, what I wanted was every one of those. So, you know, Morgan and Desarte and Josh and like the whole crew, what I wanted, what I was trying to capture was when they see the sketch, would they go, oh yeah, he nailed it. That's the, that's the idea, right? So that's a good example. Awesome. So the name of your blog is The Behavior Gap. Um, a little background about us. We're all in a business college here. Um, we all kind of come at it. Frankly, every business, every finance major first starts a, as they think they're going to go into investment banking. And then they yep. kind of transition and see all the, the different routes we can go. So The Behavior Gap in finance. So what is that? Why did you choose that as the name of your blog? Excuse me. Yeah. So originally, 
that was about a very specific concept, which is the difference between investment returns and investor returns. So for your group, I would never speak to this this way to the public, but to your group, that could just simply be the difference between time weighted rate of return and dollar weighted rate of returns. Mm -hmm. And if you look like you can look at examples for Morningstar, I think any any fund with I can't remember if it's a five or a 10 year track record, they'll have both the investments return, which is like, you know, the advertised return, the mutual fund returned 10% a year for 10 years. That's what the fund did. But it's crazy to look at this other thing called the investor return, which is how did the average dollar do in that fund? And the dilemma of course, is because money enters and leaves investments at crazy times, you know, one of my favorite examples was Bill Miller back in the in the 90s, early 2000s. Bill Miller outperformed the S&P 500 index for like 15 out of 17 years. But the average dollar in that investment over 17 years lost money. Hmm. And the reason they lost money is because for 10 years, there was no money there. Like nobody knew about Bill Miller and nobody knew he was doing well. 10 years, he gets like some accolades. He's on the cover of a magazine. So money starts flowing into the fund. 15 years, it's like, this is amazing. And a bunch of money flows in just in time for most of that money to get, get its head taken off. Mm -hmm. So that's a dramatic example around the return that the average dollar earns in an investment is never the same as the return the investment earned unless you put money in at the beginning of the period the 10 years and you leave it there and you don't add any or take away. That gap is fascinating to me. And on most, most of the time that gap is negative, meaning the average person dramatically underperforms the average investment. And that's what that original gap was, was, and that, that can only be due to poor behavior. I mean, poor timing bad luck tends to smooth out over time. So if you're dollar cost averaging or systematic investing, you'll tend to smooth that out and that gap will close. And in some cases that gap will go positive if you're dollar cost averaging because you're just really disciplined. So if there's a negative gap, it typically is some behavior. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, so I called it the behavior gap. And then now it's come to mean, and keep in mind that gap happens because of well-intentioned behavior. It's not that humans are dumb, right? It's just that we're hardwired to get, we think our job as investors is to find the best in investment. It actually makes sense when it comes to my mouth, like your job, find the best investment. Well, how do you do that? Well, you look at what's done really well. Well, what happens when you look at what's done really well? It's typically something that may not do well. It's, it's statistically unlikely that it's gonna continue to do well, right? And so you end up buying high and selling low. And, but all because you're just being human. You're just, that's well-intentioned. It's not that you're dumb. And so now I think of the behavior gap as any well-intentioned behavior that leads to suboptimal results. Hmm. That is so fascinating. For anybody who has not seen the original drawing of the behavior gap, we'll definitely leave that in the show notes because I first time I saw it, it blew me away. Um, kind of transitioning here, switching gears, Carl, I know that there's this opinion that you were trying to insert into the world um, and into the world of financial advising. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what that idea is? Yeah, so it's super important, particularly for your audience, because um, I think you're audience will already feel this way. They just may not know the words to put around it. So here, here is the opinion uh, and, and I'll explain it a little bit, but a real financial planner is not a defender of an outdated map. A real financial planner is a guide in a changing landscape. And let me just explain that real quickly. There's a whole industry and I, I I'm just sort of begging you to believe me. Like, and, and financial planning programs around the country are really, really good, but I still see this problem. There's this, uh, I think of it as physics envy, right? There's this, this, this false sense of precision 
that we can draw 30 year maps for people, right? And we even use tools that were designed to test atomic bombs called Monte Carlo, right? And we say words like I'm 97.237% confident that you're gonna meet all your goals. Now, it's not that those tools are bad. Those tools are amazing actually. It's the way we communicate about those tools. So there's this false sense of precision that is pervasive in our industry. And partially because we're human and humans don't like uncertainty. And so certainty is really, it's desirable. And I don't think we need, I don't think any of your listeners will be prone to this, but in the industry, we see this a lot. Certainty is really easy to sell. It's really easy to sell. The problem is it's impossible to deliver. And if you doubt that, just go back to January of 2000 and pull out your goals and sort of what you thought to the year 2020, sorry, the year 2020, the year 2020 would look like, right? In January. And then just compare it to what the year turned out to be starting in March, two months later, right? So certainty is impossible to deliver. And yet it's really easy to sell and we all want it and, and, and finance has numbers and calculators. So it feels like it might be physics. Like we're after sort of a law of gravity. Well, it turns out finance is nothing more than a collection of humans. Markets are nothing more than a collection of humans and humans do what humans do, which is doesn't fit an algorithm all the time. And so as a planner, what that looks like is, yeah, you create this thing called a financial plan. And often it's a straight line drawn for 30 years. Like here you are today, here's where you're going. And we present it as if I'm 97.237% confident this is the way the world's going to look. And then you realize, wait, there's no way I know this, right? Uh, like you think about everything that has to go into a financial, into financial planning software you know, you start with rates of return, standard deviation and correlation of every asset class. Well, that alone, how do we know what it's gonna look? Well, we have some good data around that, okay, fine. How about tax rates? How about inflation? Okay, th that's just the financial numbers. Now we gotta put in the really messy stuff. Clients' goals? What's gonna happen in their lives? An inheritance, a non-inheritance, a business, a non-business, people uh, passing away, like there's all sorts. Like, and then you add to it goals, which are nothing more than guesses. So it turns out financial planning is really about being a little less wrong tomorrow than it is about being precisely correct today. And the earlier you learn that, the better off you'll be. So the way that changes your interaction is more like, look, I'm a guide. Now keep in mind, like a guide. If you're a guide, if you're a mountain guide, and I've been in this situation both as a guide and as a client of a guide, if the weather gets crazy and a storm blows in, people don't blame the guide. I mean, they might, they might get a little bit mad because they need somebody because they're scared and they need somebody to vent to. A guide's not going to defend that and say, oh, I didn't know I, there was no storm on the rate. Like, you're not going to get defensive. If you're a guide, you're going to say, hey, I know you're scared, right? And I don't know exactly how this is gonna turn out, but I've been through enough storms to know that we'll figure it out. I got a bunch of tools in my backpack. It's not gonna look like the line I drew you in the hut, you know, before we left in the lodge, but I got tools in my backpack, we're gonna be okay. It's a little bit like a, a, a pilot in turbulent, what, turbulent weather. Of course they didn't plan on the turbulence or they wouldn't have flown the plane that way. When it shows up, the pilot can say, hey, it's a little bit turbulent. But guess what? I got it. I know how to do this. That's different than being a defender of a map. Defenders, financial planners who are defenders of maps. You know, when stormy weather rolls in, they spray people with facts and figures, right? Don't do stupid behavior. If you miss the 10 best days, all that kind of stuff. Turns out when people are scared, they don't want facts and figures. Right? They don't want to lecture from their financial planner about how they should stay the course. What they want, first of all, is a hug, right? Like mm -hmm. hugs before facts. And the hug may just be empathy. They want to be understood. 
our industry so often is telling people how stupid they are for behaving bad. Oh, you're buying GameStop, you're so stupid. Uh, look, those are human behaviors. So the opinion is financial planning is much more about being a guide in the changing landscape. The tools we should learn are listening and empathy, right? The tools we should learn are much more closer to being a guide than they are to selling certainty. And that's the opinion. That's going to be a very new concept to all of us who are here, like you said, in these finance classes, running Python code and coming up with precise precision. Exactly. So is there a difference between financial plans and financial planning? How should we think about that as students who are just coming into the industry? Yeah, I think you should be really, really clear about this and realize I know it's different because I work with a lot of financial planning programs around the country and, and that technical work you're doing is really, really important, right? That's the difference between a hack and a salesperson and a real professional is you've got the technical foundation. So please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the calculator is not important. It's just, I mean, we can think of it as the art and the science. The mm -hmm. science is important, but we've overplayed our hand there. We don't have a law of physics. Turns out I don't care how good your Python code is. I don't care. Like it's better be good. But at the end, I can, I can tell you one thing. One thing I know for sure about your financial plan, the only thing I know for sure is that it's wrong, right? Like the moment you hit print or save, it's wrong. I just don't know by how much or in what direction. I don't know why it's wrong yet. And so we still do all that amazing technical work. It's incredibly important. And I'm so, like, it makes me so happy to see the technical professionals that are coming out of these programs. But then we've got to lay, that's called the financial plan. Then we, after we do all that work, we got to realize that that plan is actually worthless without the ongoing process of planning, right? I can't remember who said it, but it was like Eisenhower or some, one of our military generals said something like, um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Hmm. And then of course, Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, <laughs> right? So uh, we just have to accept that reality. And so if we, if we accept that reality, we understand your real value is not the plan. And by the way, that's massively valuable. Please technically get become a rock star. Your real, your real value is in the course corrections, the ongoing process, because that plan's wrong. Next time we meet, let's figure out how it's wrong. How did things go a little differently than we thought? Have you, have, as you're thinking about where you want to go changed, did we get the returns we thought we were going to get? Did we get a new tax plan? Like, what can we adapt? We know it's going to be wrong. So then we, we, un, we help clients understand the plan is not the valuable thing. As invaluable it is, as it is, it's worthless without this ongoing. So the valuable thing becomes the relationship, the process, not the event. I'm convinced our financial planner, we just hired a new one probably about a year ago now. And I'm convinced that there is no financial plan, right? It doesn't exist. It's never going to be done. It's this on because even from like we'll have like a two hour meeting and the next day something will happen that totally changes what went on here so it doesn't exist it's a never-ending process and that's the value of it I, the professor in our program has said from the beginning a financial plan is up to date until the ink dries on the paper pretty much i'm so glad to hear that tell your professor that they're exactly right and that we need that yelled from the rooftops. Because unfortunately, a lot of our industry thinks their job is to create these two inch thick things called financial plans that somehow are an absolute reflection of what reality will look like. And we need more people saying, hey, the only thing we know for sure is that it's wrong. It's only good until the ink dries. Like that's perfect. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Shout out to Professor Schiestel. So um, Carl, this has been great. I, I wanna ask you a couple more questions here. Um, so us as young advisors, you mentioned empathy in listening, but how can we be focusing on being um, 
being a guide out here in the world? What can we be focused on? Like what skills should we be highlighting in addition to these technical skills? Yeah, so realize that your job as a financial planner is to help people make mission critical decisions in the face of irreducible uncertainty. And mm. so you're making really important decisions, often sometimes in compressed time schedules and sometimes under duress, stressful environment, and you've got incomplete information. So anybody who, if you understand that, you can start to see things from like complexity theory. That's a whole field of research around a, navigating a complex adaptive environment. You know, David Snowden out of Wales has done a bunch of this research. Um, I would read that kind of stuff. Um, Thinking in Bets, Annie Duke's book. Uh um, Jim Collins has done a little bit of work around this. The idea of how can I navigate a complex adaptive environment? Complex environments are ones that we, we might know something about the inputs, but we don't really know what goes on in the middle there. And we don't always get the same output we'd hoped. And adaptive is that the system changes based on our interaction. So markets combined with people and their money are complex adaptive systems. So anything that you can study around how you make those decisions. So decision-making with incomplete information, um, there's lots of that in the management and strategy part of a business school. Understanding that and then being really, really clear about the real cute stories we make up with the benefit of hindsight. So another book is uh, Nassim Taleb's Fooled by Randomness. He wrote Black Swans too, but I think Fooled by Randomness is a better book. And then you need to understand that in order for you to be comfortable, there's a term floating around business schools and in the academic literature around tolerance for ambiguity. What do you need to do personally to be comfortable living in an environment where uncertainty is the norm? And that takes a certain level of resilience. And so I would just be aware of that. Like I just got off a call with, a, you know, 200 more senior financial planners that have been in the business a long time. And the, the honest ones, almost always when we have these conversations, they were talking about things like burnout and stress because living in an environment where, your job is to give people really important, help people make really important decisions in the face of irreducible uncertainty. If you don't understand that going in, then you have all sorts of shame and blame. You also get stressed out. But if you understand your job is to kind of surf uncertainty with clients. So I would learn anything I could about resilience, anything I could about tolerance for ambiguity, living in uncertainty. Pema Chodron, Pema Chodron's book, um, what to do when things, oh, uh, what to do when things fall apart. When things, I think it's called when things fall apart is an amazing book. So anything around that living in a complex adaptive environment is what I would do. Awesome. Carl, this has been so insightful. Um, I've got one kind of two-part question for you that you've already kind of answered. So what we always like to leave it on here is, um, first, do you have any advice for any students who, and you like maybe wanted to go into writing or sketching? And then part two is, yeah, what, what should we be reading right now to prepare ourselves for the professional world? Yeah. So uh, part, and this involves any, anybody who wants to get to build a financial planning business, period, let alone, you know, maybe write more about it is you need to do work in public. Hmm. Like just share your work. Like, I don't care. I don't get caught up in the artifact and don't get scared. It's scary. I, I know it's scary. Like doing work in public is scary, but take, and, and one thing you can all think about is take the problem that you're trying to solve and make sure that your level of competence is 10% higher than the problem you're talking about, right? Like if you really understand cash flow and budgeting right now, start talking about it in public, 
just jump on Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn or Snapchat or Snappy Snap or wherever the cool kids are these days, right? Like go go do uh, what's what's uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, TikTok. Yeah, yeah. If you want to tick snap or Snappy Snap Snap, do whatever you want to <laughs> do. Just start sharing the work in public. And just make sure that what you're sharing is 10% below your current competence level. And it's going to slowly move up, right? As you get more comfortable. But just, I had a great conversation with a, a classmate of mine the other day. And I would practice now, now. Like today, my professor was talking about this. And I found this, this, and this interesting. Like just get comfortable doing that work in public. And practice now when it doesn't matter who's listening to you right? Because you're going to have to do it. And we need you to change the world because we've done a terrible job with it. Like we need you. And the only way you're going to do it is if you share, if you do your work in public. So I'd start doing that. And then in terms of reading, I would read Fools by Randomness and Pema Chodron's book that we already referenced. Like, I think that's more important. You're already getting the technical chops. It's awesome. I would go read Fools by Randomness and Pema Chodron's When Things Fall Apart. Awesome, Carl. Yeah, we we started this just back in September of 2020. I never put work out before, and it's amazing. Yeah, how much positive feedback we've gotten. So thank you. Th those were great words to to end on here. Yeah, awesome, Justin. Thank you. If you liked what you just heard, please like, comment, and share. This is Vincent Pacillo, producer of the MSU WMA podcast. MSU WMA, or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association, is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcast, And check out our social media at MSU WMA and MSUWMA.com.